This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Rallies were held in 12 cities Wednesday to protest the possible sale of the Tribune newspaper chain to the Koch brothers, the billionaire backers of the Tea Party and other right-wing causes. The Koch brothers are reportedly considering making a bid for the newspaper chain, which would give them control of two of the ten largest newspapers in the country, the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Tribune, and two key papers in the battleground state of Florida, the Orlando Sentinel and the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. Other papers include the Baltimore Sun and the Hartford Current. A deal could also include OI, the second-largest Spanish-language daily newspaper. According to The New York Times, the Koch brothers have quietly discussed purchasing media outlets as part of a long-term strategy to shift the country toward a smaller government with less regulation and taxes. This is Justin Melito with the Writers Guild of America East at Wednesday's protest in New York City. Today, we're out here calling on the equity firm that has stakes within the Tribune Company to not sell to the Koch brothers and not have the L.A. Times, the Baltimore Sun, the Orlando Sentinel, and other publications go the way so much of the rest of our media is going, which is under corporate control. Uh, and to see that what's happened recently with the Citizen Koch film should be a warning to everybody in this country that consolidation of corporate power and a free press do not mix in what should be a democracy. Well, what happened to the Citizen Coke documentary he refers to is what we'll look at today. The film tells the story of the landmark Citizens United ruling by the Supreme Court that opened the door to unlimited campaign contributions from corporations. It focuses on the role the Koch brothers funded group Americans for Prosperity played in backing Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, who was pushed to slash who pushed to slash union rights while at the same time supporting tax breaks for large corporations. Citizen Coke was set to air on PBS next fall until its agreement with the independent television service fell through. The story of how this happened is detailed in a piece published last week in The New Yorker magazine. Written by Jane Mayer, it's headlined, A Word from Our Sponsor, Public Television's Attempts to Placate David Koch. It begins by describing another film critical of the Koch brothers that did air on PBS, Academy Award-winning director Alex Gibney's documentary Park Avenue, Money power and the American dream, which contrasted the lives of residents who live in one of the most expensive apartment buildings in Manhattan, 740 Park Avenue, with those of poor people living at the other end of Park Avenue in the Bronx. This is a clip from that film. This stretch of Park Avenue on the Upper East Side of Manhattan is the wealthiest neighborhood in New York City. This is where the people at the top of the ladder live, the upper crust, the ultra-rich. But this street is about a lot more than money. It's about political power. The rich here haven't just used their money to buy fancy cars, private jets, and mansions. They've also used it to rig the game in their favor. Over the last 30 years, they've enjoyed unprecedented prosperity from a system that they increasingly control. In Jane Mayer's New Yorker article, she details how Neil Shapiro, president of PBS station WNET here in New York City, called David Koch, a resident of 740 Park Avenue, to warn him that the Alex Gibney film was, quote, going to be controversial. Koch was a WNET board trustee at the time. Over the years, he's given $23 million to public television. Jane Mayer writes that Shapiro offered to show him the trailer and include him in an on air discussion that would air immediately after the film. The station ultimately took the unusual step of airing a disclaimer from Koch after the film that called it disappointing and divisive. Jane Mayer reports this exchange influenced what then happened to Citizen Koch, which was set to be aired on the same PBS series called Independent Lens. The film's funder and distributor, ITVS, has now said it, quote, decided not to move forward with the project. To pick up the rest of the story, we're joined by the film Citizen Koch's two directors, Tia Lesson and Carl Deal. Their 2008 documentary, Trouble the Water, was nominated for an Academy Award. It was about Hurricane Katrina. 
Katrina. They also worked on Michael Moore's films Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11. We reached out to WNET and ITVS, but they declined to join us on the show. We'll read the statements they sent and play clips from the film Citizen Coke. But first, we welcome you, Tia and Carl, to Democracy Now! Um, so why don't you tell us about what's happened to your film? We saw you at the Sundance Film Festival. We always cover the documentary track, and uh, your film, uh, Citizen Coke, was one of those um, that was premiering at Sundance. Tia, what happened next? Well, as we were racing to meet the deadline to get to Sundance, actually, is, is when uh, the, the, we started to hear the first rumblings of problems over at ITVS. Um, it was about a week after Alex Gibney's film aired, um, and um, we got a series of frantic phone calls, actually, after we decided to change the to, to, to come up with the title Citizen Coke. We, we had had a working title, Citizen Corp, for our film. But we needed a title to go to Sundance, so we came up with Citizen Coke. They had been fine with that a week earlier. Um, but then we got a, a frantic series of text messages and phone calls, to, you know, and they desperately wanted to see, you know, the film that we were going to take to Sundance. And we were happy to give it to them. Um, uh, so I guess a couple of days after that, um, we got on the phone with um, the head of production over there, and they said, you know, if you guys don't change the name of your film, um, then we're going to have to take funding away from you. We can't have a relationship with this film under that name. And, you know, we were sort of stunned. Um, we were open to other names, you know, quite frankly, um, but we were really curious about what what was behind that. Um, and look, it took one Google search to figure out that David Koch was um, a, a board member of WNET and GBH also, um, and also a contributor. Um, so we asked very directly, did this have anything to do with the demands they were making? And, you know, they were not very transparent, but um, it, it became clear that that, in fact, there was a climate at PBS that would find the name of this film, Citizen Coke, unacceptable. Um, and we told them, look, we're happy to change the name, but not for political reasons. We're not going to change the name of our film because one of your donors is going to be angered by it. Um, so we took a principled stand. We um, thought that everything would fall apart then and there. We went to Sundance, and they told us before Sundance, no, we're still committed to your film. Um, we're on board with you. We want to see you through this, and um, and we're still in partnership. So that's that's where the story left off. And, of course, the, the Jane Mayer article that in The New Yorker has pointed out the the key role played by Neil Shapiro in, in, in the beginning to ex exert pressure on ITVS. Of course, Neil Shapiro had a long career as a network uh, executive at NBC before he came over to run the duopoly, the PBS duopoly in New York. Uh, but uh, did you at, at that time get any, any indication that Neil Shapiro was directly intervening? Look, they weren't being completely honest with us. They, they, it was clear that they were afraid of something and somebody. Um, what we now know from Jane Mayer's article is that Neil Shapiro called ITVS directly and issued some threats, including that they would that NET would pull out of their series Independent Lens um, in the aftermath of that Give Me film. And so I guess they saw our film coming down the pike and freaked out, you know. And it wasn't just that they wanted us to change the title of the film. It became clear that they wanted us to gut, you know, to, to sanitize the film, to scrub Coke out of the film altogether. Carl, can you explain the relationship between ITVS? Explain what ITVS is and what PBS is, because you weren't automatically going on WNET or PBS, but y it was your funding and your distribution? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the Independent Television Service uh, is uh, exists to support financially support the work of independent filmmakers and then to advocate for those films that it supports to go on the air on a number of different ways including their flagship series which is really the premier show showcase for high quality documentary films independent lens um, and uh, so they they have they're publicly funded um, as far as is the way we understand it is their entire budget comes from um, from tax dollars um, and um, you know so so they're good people who have a very very important mission and uh, we were really hopeful when all this was going down that they would join with us we're willing to fight for this film and we want people to advocate for it alongside us this isn't a film this isn't an expose of the Koch brothers this is a look at how big money and 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 the money of ideologically driven money from 
the wealthiest Americans is drowning out the rest of us. Well, I wanted to ask you about the ITVS response. Uh, sure. They, uh, we invited someone from ITVS to appear, but uh, they declined. But they did issue a statement. They said, "Quote: ITVS has initially recommended the film Citizen Corp for a production licensing based on a written proposal. Uh, early cuts of the film, including the Sundance version, did not reflect the proposal. However, and ITVS eventually withdrew its offer of a production agreement to acquire public." television exhibition rights. The film was neither contracted nor funded uh, by ITVS. Your response? Stunning. Stunning. We, we're, we're, we're really disappointed uh, that we have an opportunity right now for ITVS to engage in a really important conversation about who has influence over what goes on the public airwaves. Um, you know, PBS was set up, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, to serve the public interest, not private interests. And uh, so we're really disappointed with that statement because when, when ITVS came in and, and decided to become a production partner with us, we were a year into production. We had our characters cast, we had our storylines, we presented them with, with written proposals, with video proposals that completely reflect the film that we delivered. The only thing that changed from the time that they saw a, a rough cut uh, of the film uh, and the time we got into Sundance and um, these series of strange meetings started to happen was Alex Gibney's film aired. Um, well, we asked both ITVS and PBS to join us. Let me read the response, uh, the statement from the New York PBS station, WNET, that aired the Alex Gibney documentary, Park Avenue, Money, Power, and the American Dream last November, but drew criticism for giving David Koch advance notice and running his response immediately after the film, along with a roundtable discussion. They did decline our invitation to come on the program, but wrote, quote, we have previously used roundtable discussions segments to expand on programming covering controversial topics, and we invited Mr. Koch and Senator Schumer, the two main characters in the film, to participate. The statement also said, quote, with regard to the film Citizen Koch, no one at WNET knew anything about this film and never had any discussions about it with ITVS or any other entity. Your response to that, T. Lesson? I have no doubt that any T, you know, saw it. I didn't see it. I mean, I don't think Koch saw it. I, that's how insidious this is. You know, David Koch doesn't need to pick up the phone and yell at anybody. He just has to tap his wallet, and you know, our film disappears. In I mean, fact, uh, he did quit the board. He resigned from WNET um, just a week or two ago. That's right. Um, and was a major donor. Um, what has overall given something like. Twenty-three million dollars. That's right, tax-deductible dollars. You know, and it, and in exchange for that, apparently he has some some role in programming decisions um, over at NET, and I think that's really unacceptable. So, in essence, what we're lo looking at here is not necessarily a direct intervention by Coke, but self-censorship by the public uh, television community in an effort to prevent uh, someone like Coke from pulling their dollars out. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Well, and, and and actually, I think. Why does somebody like David Koch make such a major contribution to public broadcasting when, in fact, he's against public institutions like 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 public broadcasting? I think it probably has to do with having some influence over what gets said on on the public airwaves. You were at the protest yesterday um, here in New York. There were protests around the country around the issue of um, of the Kochs buying newspapers like the Los Angeles Times. What connection do you see here? Carl, well, I'm, look, we didn't enter into this conversation lightly, um, but our experience, we feel that, that our film was censored, and it was due to um, the presence of David Koch on the board. And there's a lot of discussion right now over whether or not private ownership of newspapers has an influence on how the news gets reported. And we just feel like our recent experience sheds light on that. If there were ever any doubts, um, in this case, whether or not David Koch uh, directly intervened, his mere presence had an impact on the public discourse. We're going to break, and then we come back, uh, talk about the content of your film, Citizen Koch. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.